All right, it's CVPP day. It is Thursday. It's week two. It's the winter of 22. We are going to talk about a very important subject, and that is called swelling. Specifically, swelling. There's two types of swelling. There's effusion and edema. If you're not sure which one it is, call it swelling. So let's get into it. So two types of swelling. Uh, as we said, effusion and edema. And swelling is a buildup of blood fluid or body fluid or body water, whatever you want to call it, in one or both of these compartments. So if you, if you get a buildup of body water in the transcellular compartment, which is, we talked about that last time, what these transcellular compartments are. That's like the knee joint, the ankle joint, uh, the sac around the brain, the pericardial cavity, the pleural cavity, the peritoneal cavity. Um, that would be an effusion. It's still the same thing. It's a buildup of body water. If it happens anywhere else, like in the skin, like that first picture that we saw, or inside the ankle, or not inside the ankle joint, uh, but around, anywhere else, it's called an edema. If it's inside a joint, it's an effusion, as we'll hit here in a minute. Edema versus effusion, again, we just said this. Effusion is an accumulation of this water within the transcellular compartment, specifically the big ones, the clinically important compartments that this can occur is the pericardial cavity, like from a pericarditis, which could potentially squeeze and stop the heart, right? Cardiac tamponade. It could occur within the pleural cavity. That's the sac that surrounds the lungs. And it could you, you could get a, a squishing of the lungs. You could get an atelectasis from that. Or it could occur in the uh, peritoneal cavity, a.k.a. peritoneal cavity. Um, and that's ascites, right? All right. And then, of course, in a sprained ankle, you can get in joints. So we're going to go over some of these in a minute. And then edema occurs mainly in the subcutaneous tissue, the third layer down of the skin, or the third layer down, epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, a.k.a. hypodermis, a.k.a. subcutis. Lots of a.k.a.s for this third layer down. Okay, let's get, get into edema a little deeper. It occurs when the interstitium becomes overloaded and the distal capillary can't siphon off enough of that, that blood fluid that was dumped in at the proximal part of the capillary. And the lymph capillary can't siphon off enough. So you get a buildup of interstitial fluid and you can start to visibly see it. I mean, in this ankle here, we can visibly see that both of these ankles are really swollen. In fact, we'll talk about this phenomenon of pitting edema here in a second. But that's a sure sign of, of edema. For whatever reason, the venous system of the lower extremities is not able to drain off the interstitial fluid that is dumped into the interstitium from the blood. And when edema shows up, especially if it's a generalized edema, it it typically shows up in areas that are dependent, in a position of dependence with regard to gravity. You're probably sitting at a desk right now or standing. Your feet and ankles and legs are said to be in a position of dependence. So how does blood get out of areas that are in a position of dependence? It ain't easy. Um, and therefore, it depends on gravity, whether or not that blood can get out easily or not. So it a typically, edema first shows up around the ankles like this because there, we have gravity working against blood being removed out of the lower extremities. All right, there's a severe case of it here. So yeah, when swelling shows up in the feet and ankles, it's called dependent edema. And why does it occur down here first again? Because gravity is fighting blood returning to the heart. So even if you don't have, in a normal person, they always have trouble getting 
or we always have trouble getting blood out of our lower extremities. If you've ever had a salty lunch and you've been on your feet all day and you had tight socks on and you came home and you took those socks off, you might see some lines that the socks left in your ankles. That's dependent edema and there's probably nothing wrong with you. So it's already prone to swell. Now if you add some type of pathology like a failing heart or a failing liver, uh, which is going to cause a beaver dam and it's going to cause a backup of venous blood all the way into the ankles, it's just really easy for the ankles to swell because of that. Does that make sense? All right. And remember this, we won't go over this too much again, but this is the classic model. Um, this is the interstitium in white here. In every capillary that's turned on in the body, when the blood comes in, there's higher hydrostatic pressure or blood pressure is higher at this proximal end compared to the distal end. This, this hydrostatic pressure is so high that it drives blood out into the interstitium. So we have too much fluid or blood fluid in the tissue now. But that's okay because this hydrostatic pressure decreases as you go through the capillary and it gets pretty low at this end, so low that another suction force, you can think of it as, overcomes it and is able to suck that extra interstitial fluid back into the distal capillary. So interstitial fluid goes out and it's reabsorbed in the distal capillary. Anything that's left over, remember we also have lymph vessels here. Let's see, I'm in a drawing mood today. Let's make it green. Um, so remember, we have blind-ended lymph capillaries in here as well. That can also siphon off some of the extra interstitial fluid and send that back. It actually dumps into the venous system way up, way up high by the subclavian veins. Right, so between the lymph the capillary and the distal capillary, you have a negative gain of lymph tissue, or negative gain of lymph fluid, or sorry, negative gain of interstitial fluid. When it, by the way, when the interstitial fluid gets into the lymph capillary, it's called lymph fluid. It's the same thing. It's body water. It's blood fluid that was driven out. All right. And remember the oncotic forces, the sucking forces, these yellow arrows. Uh, those are sucking on the interstitium. They can't overcome the hydrostatic pressure here. It's too high, so you're not going to get any, any fluid or molecules sucked in here. But when the hydrostatic pressure peters out in the distal capillary, the oncotic pressure is now greater than the hydrostatic pressure. Um, and that still applies with the new Starling principles, right? Starling principles, the simple old school, uh, still works. Starling principles has to do with the glycocalyx and um, that's really beyond the scope. It's not in Guyton yet, so we don't have to worry about that, in case you're wondering. All right. Let's go to the next page. All right, so the concept of a generalized edema. So generalized edema is swelling everywhere, in the face, in the wrists, in the hands, it's probably more noticeable down at the ankles because we have a tendency to swell there anyway, as we just described. Generalized edema is not a good thing. It means that there's a problem with something major, the heart, the liver, the kidneys. It typically, especially if it's an older person, there can be, it could be a reaction, an allergic reaction. Uh, burn victims can suffer a generalized edema. Some medications can do it, so it's not always a disaster. Uh, but typically, especially in the elderly, it's not, it usually, usually indicates heart failure uh, or liver failure. And we talked about this. I won't do this, go over this too much, but this is the, uh, this is why I don't draw on the board because I don't have very good drawing skills. Uh, but here's the heart, and here's a beaver dam in the heart. Let's say we have, how about aortic stenosis or tricuspid stenosis? Or maybe the heart's just failing. How's that? And the heart is can't can no longer process blood. I didn't show heart or blood coming out of the heart. 
but of course normally I could draw the ascending e order right here we can just draw it in here and normally blood is processed and it comes shooting out of the heart well if you have a roadblock to blood going through the heart that blood is going to back up okay so the heart can't process let's say normally the heart processes seven liters of blood per minute just out of the blue not correct number now you have a failing heart and it can only process three and a half liters of blood per minute what's going to happen well you get a backup of blood waiting to come go through the heart just like there's a backup um, going out into the ocean right now because we don't have enough resources to process all the goods coming in on ships so we have a huge backup it's the same type of deal so we have a backup and where's the backup of blood go I don't know why it does that sometimes another problem with this Dell laptop anyway it backs up into the lungs okay great it causes pulmonary edema and pulmonary hypertension maybe you're, you have some pink frothy sputum you're spitting up then it backs up the backup continues right it comes back into the heart right we're just going backwards through the path so it's pulmonary trunk now we're in the right side of the heart so we know that the right side of the heart pumps very hard to try to fight this back up and eventually you wear out the right side of your heart and you get right sided heart failure first the heart gets really big you get hypertrophy of the right heart right atrium and right ventricle uh, but in the meantime, while that's happening, the backup goes, I mean, it goes up here. It just follow the, f what is it doing that? This Dell, comp oh, I don't like this. I like my old Windows 7 Dell attitude. Anyway, it backs up, up into the veins here, up into the jugular veins. And you can get a Kuzmol sign, which I don't think we've talked about yet, but I have videos on it and we will talk about it your jugular vein bul bugs out when you take a breath in the backup goes down into the liver and the liver swells up we're going to talk teach you how to palpate the liver and there's a test where you can poke the liver and you can make the jugular vein bug out so now through the portal system remember we have the inferior vena cava going into the liver and we have the hepatic or we have the portal system going in here as well common or the the portal vein uh, splits into a splenic vein so the backup can go right over to the spleen and you get the spleen to blow up and that's splenomegaly and then the backup can go down uh, superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric veins into the intestinal veins and the intestinal veins can start leaking and your peritoneal cavity starts getting filled up with blood right then through the venous side through the inferior vena cava we go down here to make this a little more correct uh, the blood can also back up through the through the inferior vena cava all the way into the lower extremities so you get dependent edema down here you get swelling around the ankles um, and so and then it goes everywhere right it goes it goes into the arms and into the legs so you get swelling everywhere in the body because of a beaver dam here now you can also get beaver dams in the liver maybe you have hepatitis from something and the liver isn't working good well then the upper extremities are going to be okay they're not going to be swollen but anything downstream or actually the blood flow is this way so anything upstream from the liver is going to blow up if you have if you have a beaver dam in the liver like the spleen like the ascites water fluid blood fluid in the peritoneal cavity and swelling down here in the ankles as well see how that works and we'll get more into that right now all right so what are the causes of general edema as i just said beaver dam in the heart so when the heart fails, it's called cardiomyopathy. Um, there's several different types. Uh, you could call it congestive heart failure, congestive cardiomyopathy, heart failure. They're all kind of AKs for the heart is failing. We can break it down a little bit. Maybe you have atherosclerosis really bad and the pipes are clogged up and the, and the heart is becoming ischemic and breaking down and not working. 
Uh, that's called ischemic cardiomyopathy. Maybe you have aortic and mitral valve stenosis. Did I say tricuspid valve back in my example? Uh, that was wrong. That was mitral valve. It has to be on the left side of the heart. It just popped into my head. Um, so that's if, if you have an aortic valve or mitral valve that is sticky and doesn't open, well, then you have the heart will fail because the heart has to pump very, very hard to try to overcome that. And you wear out your heart. And that's called valvular cardiomyopathy or valvular heart failure. And then chronic hypertension. Maybe your arterioles are all clogged up uh, with some type of arterial sclerosis. Or maybe your sympathetics are always on and your arterioles are very narrow. Your heart has to pump hard to properly pressurize the capillaries. It has to work hard to pump through those narrow arteries and you wear out your heart like that. That's, and that causes hypertension. So that's called hypertensive cardiomyopathy. Maybe you get an infection of your heart, myocarditis, and it damages the heart and it fails. Um, alcohol. Alcohol is like poison to the heart. Uh, alcoholics often destroy their hearts, get heart failure. And sometimes the heart fails from genetic conditions, uh, which I'm not going to get into right now. Um, so you could call it idiopathic. And sometimes we don't know what happened and the heart just fails. But the heart is not the only thing that can cause generalized edema. And it all goes back to this example. So these, this yellow, this oncotic, this suction force to drain the interstitial fluid. If something goes wrong with this suction force, that's another cause of general swelling. If we, if you, and the, what causes this oncotic pressure? this oncotic suction force, and it's a little more complicated, but for pathology students, I think this is fine. What causes this? It's mainly albumin. It's, those, it's that gigantic albumin molecule that's made by the liver. So anything that interferes with albumin production, maybe of liver disease, or maybe you're losing albumin through the kidney, if you don't have enough albumin, or maybe you're burned and you're losing albumin into the interstitium, if albumin is not trapped in the capillaries, you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have oncotic pressure, um, and therefore you don't have a way to suck the interstitial fluid back out of the interstitium, and you're going to swell. All right. So with that in mind, um, let's look at kidney disease. So if albumin is lost into the urine or into the filtrate, you're going to swell. If you have liver disease, well, that causes a backup. If you have cirrhosis or hepatitis, um, then you can't make albumin, and that's going to cause swelling. Plus, it's going to cause a beaver dam effect in the lower extremities. So you're going to swell your spleen. It's going to swell. Your belly's going to swell, and your ankles are going to swell. Kind of a double whammy. Um, General allergic reactions, if you have histamine overproduction, histamine causes leaky capillaries and too much interstitial fluid gets out, too much blood fluid gets out of the blood and becomes interstitial fluid. Distal capillaries and lymph capillary can't keep up, they can't siphon it off and you swell. Burns, if you damage so many capillaries in your body and you leak albumin out of your bloodstream, well, you, you're going to swell. You, you need albumin circulating in the blood to help drain the interstitium. And then there's a rare capillary leak syndrome. I think I took that out because it's just so rare. Um, we should go down a little beaver or a little uh, rabbit hole, though, and talk about the nephrotic syndrome. That's so common. Um, so the glomerular capillaries can also become really, really leaky. Well, it's not really the glomerular capillaries. We'll see what the cause is here in a second. Uh, but you can leak albumin. In this condition, nephrotic syndrome, the main problem is you leak albumin into the urine or into the filtrate, which becomes urine. So the kidney can't, uh, can't reject albumin like it's supposed to, and albumin escapes the bloodstream. And what's going to happen if you don't have albumin? 
this disturbing picture here. This poor little newborn is all swollen up like crazy because he doesn't have any albumin. Right? Uh, some fun facts. It's the most common glomerular disease of childhood. It's rare. It's not as rare as Marfan. So it's twice as common as Marfan, but it's still really rare. 0.02% of, of kids have this disease. And it's really a problem with the podocyte layer. We'll look at that in a second. And yeah, these kids, they leak albumin into the filtrate, and the filtrate, of course, becomes urine. So albumin's not in the blood, and you can't, without albumin, you can't siphon off the interstitial fluid like you're supposed to. Um, and the podocytes are the problem. So I'm not going to get into the physiology weeds on this, uh, but this purple is an endothelial cell on the glomerular capillary. Remember, endothelial cells are fenestrated. So they have big holes. It's like a fence or poked holes in them. And so, I mean, that's pretty leaky, right? All sorts of things can leak out of this. Here's the pre-urine right here. Bowman space, this stuff is going to yellow. It's going to become urine. And this is in the kidney. This is happening. And so podocytes are the last offense. They're like little little creatures here and they have feet and their feet don't let albumin get out and this basement membrane is important too but we're not going to get into the weeds on that so people with this condition the feet are defective they're shrunken they're inflamed they're stiffened and they can't stop albumin from getting in to the urine so here's an albumin molecule coming around it goes through the fenestrated capillary. It gets through the basement membrane, glomerular basement membrane. Normally, it stopped right here. But in patients with this nephrotic syndrome, it can get right through here. And now we have albumin in the urine, and that's ultimately going to go into the toilet. And there's no way to return albumin once, once it gets in the, in the urine the prefill or in the filtrate here right and it's not albumin it's a globulin there's other blood proteins that are that help with that oncotic um, colloid osmotic pressure if you will i call it oncotic pressure all right so that's kind of the story with that um, there's a classic triad now i can almost guarantee you this is going to be on my test and high yield or high chances it'll be on boards because on boards, just like my test, there's only four answer choices. They're all multiple choice questions, only four answer choices. So when I see a question like this, oh, that's perfect for me to make a question. So the triad, the nephrotic syndrome triad, what is it? So these people have hypo, meaning low, albumin is albumin, emia is blood. So they have low albumin in the blood. Uh, Where does the albumin go? Well, it gets into the filtrate and goes into the toilet. It becomes urine. So they have proteinuria, protein, in the urine. And then as a result of this, they swell because they don't have albumin. And so they swell up. They get a generalized edema. And just like this little girl has the nephrotic syndrome here. And her face is all swollen. And you can see that, boy, if we haven't gotten to... Cushing syndrome yet, but that sure looks like a Cushing's kid. Uh, they got the facial plethora, the slappy cheeks, the red cheeks. They got the moon face, but it's not. That's swelling. You look at her ankles, they're going to be swollen. You can probably pity Nadim in the ankles. So kids can be misdiagnosed with Cushing syndrome when really they have the nephrotic syndrome. Got it? Uh, what causes the podocyte damage? Uh, there's two general classes. There's primary causes and secondary causes. Primary causes are a kind of a hardening of the podocytes in a condition or a pathological situation called focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS, better known as. Um, so there's many diseases that can cause FSGS, like diabetes, sickle cell anemia, and certain medications like lithium can do that. We won't go any deeper than that. Uh, but the podocytes get damaged, uh, fibrotic, and they shrink. 
and therefore their feet can't stop. It's more complicated than that, but their feet can't stop the, the albumin from leaking into the filtrate. Secondary causes include lupus, amyloidosis, and viral infections that can also damage the little feet of the podocytes. All right, so that's enough about the nephrotic syndrome. How in the world can a burn victim get generalized edema? Well, I kind of said it already, but if you're burned over 30%, 40% of your body, your albumins, you have damaged a lot of capillaries. Right? Capillaries aren't that deep. They're in the subcutaneous tissue. They're the third layer down. They're even in the dermis. Right? You can, and birds go all the way down into the subcutaneous tissue, maybe even down deeper. But the, the damaged capillaries are going to leak like crazy, and they leak. You literally leak all your albumin, not into the kidney, not into the urine, but you leak your albumin into the burned area. And without albumin, you're going to swell over your whole body. And it's really as simple as that. And uh, almost like the little baby, here's someone who was severely burned, who didn't make it. 80% burned this patient, but look at their face. It's just completely swelled up because they don't have any albumin, even though they're giving them an IV with albumin in it. Um, so albumin is super, super important. No oncotic pressure. All right, that's enough. Now effusion. So effusion is not edema. Effusion means that this, this swelling is going to occur inside of a space, like here's someone who sprained their ankle, and you can see their ankle is swollen. Um, so that's not edema, that's an effusion. You have to know something about the, the injury too, because you can see it kind of looks like edema. But I can see some purple here from some uh, ripped ligaments have bled. So let's talk it over. Um, effusion is also a buildup of, of blood fluid, but this time it's not within the skin, it's within the transcellular compartment. Specifically, it's within the peritoneal cavity, the pleural cavity, the pericardial cavity, the knee joint, the ankle joint, the elbow joints of the body, and it can be within the brain as well, in the subdural uh, cavity, you could call it. Uh, and within, well, we said joints already, right? So make sure when you're writing report if, on someone with a sprained ankle, they don't have edema around their ankle, they have an effusion around their ankle. Don't make that silly mistake. So let's talk about the peritoneal cavity first. Uh, so if blood fluid leaks into the peritoneal cavity, you get a condition called, called ascites or hydroperitoneum or hydroperitoneum, whichever way you like to say it. And you can see their belly is all filled up with fluid. By far, the number one cause of ascites is cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, Moore says it's 85% of the time when someone has ascites, it's cirrhosis of the liver. And it's, as we said already, it's a double whammy because if the liver is messed up, the liver makes albumin. So without albumin, you're going to swell over your whole body. So you got that going on. Plus, you have a backup of blood. You can't get portal blood and you can't get inferior vena cava blood through the liver. So it backs up and it drains out. Uh, the blood fluid accumulates in the, in the belly, in the peritoneal cavity, and in the lower extremity as well. So you do get a semi-general edema with this as well. All right, so double whammy. Make sure you know the double whammy. Um, just to remember your anatomy, to bring this back, so here is the hepatic portal vein, which we studied in, was it gross two, I believe? Remember that splits into a splenic vein. So if you get a beaver dam, and we've done this already, so I guess I don't have to do it again, but I'll do it. We'll make the blood green. So if you get scarring and disease of the liver, it's hard to drain blood through the liver and into the inferior vena cava. So you get a backup, and the backup can go down the splenic vein into the spleen, and you get splenomegaly. We're going to teach you how to test for splenomegaly. And then it can go into the intestines through the superior and inferior mesenteric veins, 
and it can drip out. Where's the interstitium? There is no interstitium, so it just accumulates in the peritoneal cavity. So your belly becomes awful of fluid to get ascites. Uh, plus, they didn't show very good the inferior vena cava, uh, but that can get crimped as well. And so you can get a backup down the inferior vena cava into the ankles, and you can get dependent edema, swelling around the ankles as well. Make sense? All right, here's an, let's do a case, but before we do the case, here's a normal chest film, right? There's the heart shadow. Costophrenic angles are nice and sharp down here. So we look at those, they look great. Um, yeah, normal chest film. Now look at this guy, 58-year-old, long history of alcohol abuse. Uh, he complains of six weeks of dry cough, malaise, dyspnea, and exertion. So he's getting maybe some chest pain as well. He's got neck pain. He thinks there's something wrong with his neck causing all this. Uh, you say, you know, we better do, Mr. Jones, let's do a chest film of you just to see what's going on. Here's his chest film. What do you think? Yeah, where's the costophrenic angles? Right? Where's these things? You guys can see those? Turn my tools on. You should have co sharp costophrenic angles. Right? No fluid in there. Now look at now look at this guy's. See there's no angle. They're filled. This is all fluid. Yep, so he's got he's also had an aortic aneurysm too to make things worse. So yeah, so he's got a hydrothorax. So he's got a accumulation of fluid draining out into the into the pleural cavity and, and filling things up. Right? Why did that occur? Because he's got heart failure from all the alcohol. And plus, I mean, he had a pro he had an aneurysm in his aorta might be contributing. Maybe the aortic valve isn't working good, but hey, he's got heart failure from the alcoholism. And so the blood backed up all the way into the pleural cavity. Uh, let's see, what else do we need to say? That's about all we need to say about that. Um, what else causes swelling? There's more things. Well, what if there's something wrong? Here's a better drawing than I did of the lymph capillary. Remember, every capillary has a lymph capillary that's entangled with it to help drain off the lymph fluid. So what if something goes wrong? What if you get a beaver dam in the lymph capillary? Well, that's no good, right? If you get a beaver dam, whether it be cancer cells or bugs, uh, or a tumor pushing and pinching this pipe. If you get a beaver dam, let me as well draw it right now. Uh, what color should we make this? Let's try it orange. So if we get a beaver dam here, for whatever reason, cancerous tumor, you bugs, who knows what it is. If you get a beaver dam, normally you have lymph draining here up to the subclavian vein, you got a beaver dam. You can't. So the lymph fluid backs up and backs up and backs up and backs up, and now it backs up into the interstitium. Right? Your, your interstitium can't drain the blood fluid away. Um, and so you get a swelling, probably not a general swelling, though. It's going to be more localized swelling uh, in the legs, one leg, wherever the beaver dam occurs, unless it's you know, way up, way up high, the thoracic duct maybe. But usually it's going to be more localized. See how that works? What can cause the beaver dam? What can clog the lymph vessel here? Cancer. Uh, metastatic disease. Cancer cells. Cancer that's gotten loose from the breast maybe wandered into this interstitial fluid and got sucked up by the lymph system. And now it's sticking to the walls. Or maybe it's gotten into the lymph node and it's growing in the lymph node. Or maybe it's growing here. But it's causing a beaver dam. That can do it. Bugs, filariasis, very common in third world countries. Lymphatic filariasis caused by the W. Bancrofti uh, bug. It's a roundworm that, for whatever reason, loves these vessels. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, this is probably going to be a more localized event, probably localized to the arm that it occurs in, or the arms or the legs or something like that. 
So here is filariasis, third world country, where they didn't treat him. And you can see the he's got these roundworms that are just filled, and all the lymph capillaries are filled with roundworms. And his lymph system can't drain, and therefore it's backed up and it's caused skin damage, and pretty soon this will turn to gangrene, and he's going to lose this whole leg. It's starting over here as well. Um, vitamin B12 deficiency can also cause general edema. It's it's more rare, uh, but it can it can happen because you need vitamin B12 to make methionine, and you need methionine to make albumin for albumin synthesis in the liver. So no B12, no methionine, no methionine, no albumin, no albumin no oncotic forces or decreased oncotic forces and there you go um, your interstitium is going to swell like crazy histamine overproduction could be localized probably more localized but remember mast cells release histamine as part of an allergic reaction to cat hair or dog hair or oak trees or whatever your allergen is uh, but they cause increased capillary permeability. Uh, specifically, they cause endothelial cells to shrink. So the spaces between adjacent endothelial cells get huge, and way too much lymph fluid is poured in the proximal capillary, and it, it's, it's not very good at reabsorbing it. And so that tissue where that's going on will swell like crazy. Right. Histamine also affects, we looked at this met arterial last time, histamine, and we said that all capillaries can't be opened, right? Skin, that takes turns. These capillaries are usually closed. These are the capillary servicing cells. They can't be all opened at the same time. But histamine can bind to these precapillary sphincters and pop them open when they don't need to be open. So you get way too much blood fluid accumulating everywhere. Your blood pressure can start to drop if this is uh, severe, which is one of the dangers of anaphylaxis. All right, uh, what about kind of a localized type of swelling? Yeah, well, valve injury. People who've had DVTs uh, or people with varicose veins have injured valves. And so we need valves in the lower extremities to get to get the blood out of the lower extremities. Even if you're perfectly healthy, you have trouble getting blood out of your lower extremities because there's no heart down in your ankle to help pump blood up against gravity. And so you're very dependent on those valves. And I'm, I used to talk this, I have a YouTube video on this where I go into the weeds on valves, but I'm not gonna do that anymore. You guys should know this already from physiology. But remember, here's your soleus muscle. And remember that here's blood. Let me get my drawing tools out again. Let's see, we're making blood green these days. Um, so blood is like hanging out here. Well, let's do this one first. So blood is hanging out here. It's, it's stuck. Okay, here's the heart. The heart is up here trying to get blood out of the legs back to the heart. But we have the force of gravity. Let's make that red. We have the force of gravity pushing down, and it's stopping blood from, from flowing back to the heart. But when you're up and you're moving, I mean, a little bit can get up because of the negative pressure inside your thoracic cavity sucks blood upwards, amongst other things. Uh, but normally, if you're in a position of dependence and you're perfectly still and your soleus muscles aren't contracted, your blood's going to be, it's going to be stuck. What's that? Right? But when you contract, let's say you move around or you stand up and your soleus muscle contracts, it literally squeezes the blood forward. It squeezes some of it backwards too, but these valves, these valves snap shut to retrograde flow blood. Just like we talked about the aortic valve. It won't let blood go backwards. But this squeezing shoots blood up. And then when you relax again, the blood tries to come back down, and these valves close right off. 
And so your blood in your lower extremity is literally ratcheted step by step by step out of your lower extremities. That's what you can you see now if you don't have these valves, what's going to happen? Yeah, you, the blood's going to have a really tough time getting out of the lower extremities and it's going to accumulate. And that's what happens to people with dysfunctional valves or people who have had blood clots. Blood clot, clots happen on these valves and wreck them. So if you have faulty valves, you can have swelling in your low extremity. We're going to talk about that more in lab and how that can, how that can present as sciatica sometimes. But when you have faulty valves and you have chronically, all the time you have too much pressure, you have too much venous blood buildup in your around your ankles. That's got a name. That's called chronic venous insufficiency, guaranteed on the test. Chronic venous insufficiency uh, means that the veins are, and it's kind of a weird way to say it because they're not really insufficient, um, but it, it means that the valves are insufficient and it's causing way too high of pressure, too much blood in the around the ankles in that gator area it's called around the ankles gator area um, and that causes venous stasis way too high pressure venous hypertension way too much pressure and that pressure can start to damage the skin and we can detect people with chronic venous insufficiency by looking at their skin let's go into that a little deeper what's the sequelae of this chronic high pressure and how does that work? How does it damage the skin? Well, here's a skin cell. And normally it gets fed. Here's an artery. And normally the proximal part of the artery, let's see what color should we make? We'll make it orange. Um, so here's a molecule of oxygen. And normally, just pretend these fish aren't, aren't here, normally the oxygen just shoots right through the interstitium and it feeds the cell. Maybe there's a couple fish. These fish represent water molecules. This is blood fluid that was driven out of the artery. If you have too much free water in the interstitium, like this pitcher, it's really hard to get the oxygen and glucose and nitrogen uh, to, to feed the cell. By the time it gets there, the cell might be dying or it might have died, or it might be close to death, releasing chemicals when they die, cytokines, inflammatory stuff. Um, so that interstitium, it hinders the feeding of the cells, and it hinders the waste removal. Um, so lactic acid can start building up all over the place and make this an acidic environment. See how that works? All right, so what are the skin changes that will occur? Well, first you get pain. The skin will start to hurt. Um, but then you can start to get a couple of these things. If you have too high of pressure in the microcirculation of the legs, you're going to get tiny varicose veins, and that's called telangiectasia. You can literally see these. We'll look at pictures. You can also get red blood cells going out into the interstitium if the pressure gets that high. You can get a red blood cell that gets out in the interstitium and it explodes and it releases something called hemosiderin. And that's like getting a tattoo from the inside out. It stains your skin brown. So that's what the brawny indurations are. There's another word for that. I can't think of that right now. There's an AK for that. Hemosiderin stains a.k.a. brawny indurations. Um, if the skin continues, um, the cells start dying. If they start dying faster than they can be replaced, you start to get holes from all the dead skin, and you get ulcers. And if it still isn't fixed up, it can get infected with bacteria, and it can die, and you can get gangrene. Right? So here's someone with patient with heart failure and liver disease. Uh, even with compression stockings, she should be wearing full compression stockings, not these little half ones. Uh, but you can see that she's got quite a bit of edema. And if you look closely, we can see some skin changes, early skin changes happening here. This is, this is that scenario where the fish are stopping the feeding of these cells. 
Um, sometimes they shows up like this. Actually, one of my ankles looks not quite this bad, but fairly similar because I had blood clots in my leg. And I have chronic venous insufficiency now since I had that. So this is telangiectasia. Uh, so the patient is trying their best. We don't see any swelling in their ankle now, but when you see this, it means that they have frequent bouts of very high pressures in the ankle uh, and they can't they're not getting blood out and so it's causing little varicose veins because of that that's called telangiectasia um, here's some brawny indurations that have occurred and why some people get skin changes like this and some people get skin changes like that some people get both of these but we don't know why that is why doesn't this person have telangiectasia don't know uh, but it's just another sign. So these are brawny indurations. You ever see this in someone with sciatica, you got to wonder if they have a blood clot. Because if your valves aren't working, um, you're at increased risk for thrombosis. Talk about that more in lab. And we can go a step further. So this is a person with venous insufficiency. And they got an ulcer starting because of it. And then here's the last step. This patient has waited too long chronic venous insufficiency, not taken care of, uh, their toe is, looks horrible, and they have gangrene. So they're going to, preoperative, they have to remove this, right? They could die of septicemia if they don't get rid of this nasty thing. So gangrene. Um, pitting edema is a sure sign. How do you tell if someone has, has edema? Uh, you can do this pitting edema test just push into their foot or push into their malleoli and see if it leaves a pit. That means that the they have too much blood fluid, too much interstitial fluid around that's not being held in a proteoglycan gel. That's free water running wild in the interstitial. Also make sure when you test it on the, on the leg, after you do the ankle, you should go up the medial surface, the medial tibial surface. Um, not the lateral. That's Tom, Dick, and Harry. Muscles live out lateral to that tibial, um, that kind of your shin bone, that sharp uh, anterior border of the tibia. You want to go medial to that to test uh, for pitting edema. Right. Everything I said. Great. Uh, one more topic and we're done. Static or stasis dermatitis, as we said. Uh, cells, if you acutely starve cells of oxygen and nutrients, um, some can die and release cytokines and spark an inflammation acutely. And that, so stasis dermatitis can occur uh, acutely from very high pressures. And we're going to use my Hawaii trip as an example. So, and it can be quite painful. Mine was painful. Not like crazy painful, but I caught it early, as we'll see in a second. Um, but yeah, if the pressures, if you accumulate too much venous blood in your lower extremities and feet, you can kill cells. They can release cytokines and spark an inflammation, and your whole skin can become on fire. So here's me in the morning um, after breakfast, and I'm walking around. I'm in Hawaii, so I'm not used to walking around in hot tropical weather but we're walking around at the mall I don't have my compression stockings on I wore them on the flight over but I don't need them I you know and uh, my wife looks at my legs and she's like you need to put your compression stockings on right now that doesn't look good I don't know what it is but that doesn't look good and I'm like ah oh, I was laying out I got some sunburn there it's just sunburn you know always listen to your wife at least my wife is very wise so I didn't listen to her. So we're, I'm up the rest of the day, and now it's 6, 7 o'clock at night, and my my ankles are hurting. And you want to see what they look like later that night? So pretty nasty. They're swollen. I got pitting edema here. They're just really a dark red. They're just inflammation everywhere from an acute buildup of, of blood fluid here, which I'm not used to. So had to go to the emergency room. Um, got some powerful steroid cream, which I had at home and I didn't bring with me. Uh, put my compression stockings on, blasted the air conditioning. 
Next day was rainy. We had a tropical storm come through, so I stayed in all day with my ankle elevated, and I was good to go the next day, much, much better the next day. So that's, that's an example of stasis dermatitis. Um, and then if, I mean, I could have added this in, but people with chronic fluid buildup in the lower extremities, there is uh, some treatment that you can do besides elevation, cold. You can use diuretic therapy. Uh, Lasix has probably been around forever. Uh, they're like water pills. They cause the kidney to over-secrete water, and that helps get rid of some of this excess fluid. Uh, so you should know Lasix is, is a common form of di diuretic therapy. I have a video on all the there's a whole bunch of different types of them. I went into the weeds, but I don't think we need to go that far into the weeds. Okay, so that's it. So I'm into bird photography now. I've done these as extra credit questions before, so I would become familiar with our local birds here. This is a cool one. It's kind of a raptor. Um, it's called a white-tailed kite. White-tailed kite. It's like a hawk. It's got talons, and it hunts rodents and fish and anything it can get its little claws into. All right, I will do the GIG lecture. Uh, I'm going to try to start it on time. I feel pretty good right now, but I've been getting tired uh, kind of easy, so I might, um, might do it a little later. All right, see you later.